Hey everyone, and welcome to another edition of Drone Life News. My name is Paul, as always, and joining me, as always, editor in chief of dronelife.com, also has the nickname of Smiley. Hello, Miriam. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Paul. Always glad to see you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Yeah, New Year, new stuff. Kind of segues right into uh, our first story with CES, but it seems like there really wasn't a lot at CES as many manufacturers had kind of pulled out last minute. So what do you have for us? Well, you know, CES has been an interesting show this year. We haven't gotten as many press releases as we usually do across but there is still something for the drone industry. So Autel made a big showing at CES this year, brought out uh, their drones to kind of show that they're available now, let everybody take a look at them. In the mainstream media, what we're seeing is a big play in the automotive field, sort of everything automotive, everything vehicular, everything automated. And uh, the drone industry didn't miss out on that either. So we're seeing EV tolls, emission free, ultra compact EV tolls, passenger drones, you know, one person flying cars, you name it. Uh, that's what's there, uh, new and exciting in the drone industry. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, definitely not a lot uh, focusing on the drone industry. It's almost like they moved on to passenger quote-unquote drones, which, you know, as we were talking about in pre-show, the last CES uh, that I went to, 2020, which arguably probably caught COVID there, um, but, uh, you know, arguably a lot of the stuff that we saw from CES in 2020 haven't really seen, you know, in the real world, the Volocopter, where's that thing? The new egg drone, where's that thing, you know? So uh, it really seems like CES kind of seems like a dud for the drone industry, at least if you're not in urban air mobility. Well, I don't know. You know, Volocopter, that one I have seen uh, out and about. So that uh, that is definitely out there. I think that uh, it was a, maybe a little bit more of a new thing several years ago and we have matured now we're um you know in with all the other new things at ces so sorry i didn't get to go this year um and hopefully i'll get sort of more announcements and things as uh the week carries on yeah i mean you know with uh with the conference mandating uh certain uh shots and whatnot and so many manufacturers pulling out and then omicron happening at the same time kind of like a triple whammy to CES. So uh, it is in addition to weather and flight complications here in the U S which have snarled up airports for several days. So good luck to everybody who's there. Please send us notes. Let us know how it is and um, hope that you are staying safe and traveling well. <laughs> yeah. Yes, definitely. Um, this brings up a question, Miriam. What do you think is going to be the environment for conferences this year? I know a lot of people had kind of assumed that this would be the year that conferences really kind of get back to normal. But uh, do you think that that's going to happen? Are you seeing a lot of information coming out about future conferences? Or if you were to make a guesstimate, what would you predict? Gosh, I really, really hope that 2022 is going to be the year maybe because we were really trying and, you know, I did get out to a couple of conferences. I'm really looking forward to AUVSI in Orlando in the spring. So fingers crossed um, that Omicron sort of um, takes us on to the next more manageable phase of the pandemic. I don't know. Um, that's not my thing. I'm not making any big statements here about about, um, about the pandemic. But um, yeah, I do think that what most shows are learning is that you got to have a backup plan because, you know, there's um, it's just been too unpredictable this year. So yeah, next thing we know, Delta Cron will be here and shut down the next set of conferences. So, but uh, it's definitely a confusing time to say the least. So, that said, moving into the next piece of news, 
It looks like another domestic manufacturer pops up, but don't confuse their name with the old VHS players that we use at home. And yes, I am old enough to know about that. But what's going on here with Zenith? I know that's not the full name, but I thought just to make the show a little lighter, it would be fun to talk about just Zenith. So what do you got here? Zenith Aerotech sent across a piece of news, and I thought that this was kind of significant news and and worthwhile for us to bring up here. Zenith Aerotech is making um, tethered drone stations. They're doing really well. They are taking a lot of orders. And so what they've done is partnered with another U.S. manufacturer with um, sort of larger manufacturing capacity. And the reason I think that's kind of interesting is Zenith uh, Aerotech is a main the USA company. It is U.S. based, but they're kind of looking ahead and saying, yeah, we're still stuck with these supply chain issues. Uh, Manufacturing has been very difficult. We've got a lot of demand generating. We're going to make sure that we can um, meet that demand and we are going to increase our supply capacity. And I think that You know, hopefully that's a theme that we sort of see repeated with the U.S. industry and, frankly, the international industry that people sort of smooth through those supply chain issues and increase their manufacturing because that's a persistent theme where availability kind of becomes a headline. You start seeing headlines that say, This drone model is available, even though it's been announced um, quite a while ago. Availability has become a headline because those supply chain um, challenges are so significant for manufacturers. Yeah, I mean, it seems like almost the drone industry is is propping up a lot of new manufacturing across the U.S. And with Samsung building a new semiconductor plant in Tyler, Texas, it seems like maybe in a year or two, those supply chain issues uh, might secede, but for the meantime, they will persist, it seems like. They will, but I'm sort of hopeful, um, you know, without being too much of a Pollyanna, and and you know that I am always sort of a look on the bright side kind of person, (laughs) I try to be a glass half full. (laughs) Um, We're good together, Paul, we're good. Um, (laughs) But I do think that, uh, that people have learned from these last couple of years, and you know, having that new manufacturing As you mentioned here in Texas, that people are bringing their sourcing closer, they're increasing their supply capacities, they're introducing more diversity in their distribution channels. And I think I really am seeing that kind of across the board in the drone industry, and it's mimicked in, you know, broader industry across the board. So I do think that um, if there is one good thing that's kind of come out of this whole situation, it's that people are learning how to make their supply chains more resilient. Yeah, definitely, definitely. In our next piece of news, many of you who have been drone pilots for a while will remember the Swiss-made drone that showcased the original drones for good, of how drones can essentially carry life-saving uh, technology devices that can help people at their most imminent time of need. And here we are seven or eight years later, not sure exactly how many years later it's been, but finally an AED has been flown now on a drone saving someone's life. So we saw the idea years ago and now today it's actually been used to save someone's life. What do you have here, Miriam? Yeah, absolutely. This this is, I don't even know, I could search on Drone Life and see when the first time I wrote about this was. You're right, it was was probably five or six years ago. But this kind of highlights the fact that there's a big difference between being able to create the technology that can carry an AED and getting the permissions to fly across a city and also being integrated into a city's um, emergency response network. So that is a very complex project. It requires a lot of players to agree on the rules. It requires um, everyone to meet with a lot of regulations. 
So finally, that has actually happened. We have seen a life saved by drone delivery of an AED gentleman who was uh, shoveling his driveway, collapsed uh, in his driveway. He did have cardiac arrest, uh, a heart attack. Um, A doctor was driving by on his way to work, stopped, dialed 911, he says the next thing he knew, he looked up and there was a drone with an AED, was able to administer the appropriate treatment, and the gentleman has made a full recovery. And I think that this is really exciting for the drone industry because here's this theme that's been kind of uh, introduced over the last few years, which is at what point are we going to start saying not what is the cost of implementing these drone technologies, but what is the cost of not implementing these drone technologies? And once you start racking up lives saved from things like an AED, where if somebody undergoes cardiac arrest, you know, the difference between one minute and three minutes is huge in the outcome. Um, You know, the difference between 10 minutes and 12 minutes when you're talking about a burrito, it's not so much, you know, It's, it's not that big a deal. But when it comes to things like AEDs, it is really significant. And so I'm so happy to see this, you know, happy for the gentleman whose life was saved, but also really happy to see a successful implementation And I think that emergency services around the world are going to start asking themselves, you know, what do we need to do to get this? What is the cost if we don't introduce this in our community? So where exactly did this take place? Did I miss that? I believe it is Sweden. Ah, okay. It also makes me wonder in the time of the labor shortages, especially in the medical fields right now, could a drone EMT delivery service help aid in the labor shortage. It really makes me wonder, you know, if obviously it would take a lot of infrastructure to be built out, but it does really beg the question of could it help soon enough to uh, kind of take the, that uh, issue. I mean, like, you know, I remember uh, in college, my roommate was in medical school and we were talking about how cool it would be to have, you know, a ring that essentially you could put your arm into and it straight up does an ultrasound of your arm, finds your veins, could take a sample, give you an IV, you know, whole nine yards. How far away are we from, you know, uh, that world? Because I will say, after getting stuck with an IV a, a few dozen times, I would trust a robot more than some of these people. I don't know about you, but if you've ever felt someone fishing for one of your veins, it'll definitely make you pass out. So. <laughs> So that, you know, I don't know how far away we are from that, but I have seen all kinds of um, medical applications come across my desk. And and even when you think about it, if, uh, think about sort of the SWAT team drones, right? Like the Brink drones. One of the reasons that the Brink drones are so important is that they can establish two-way communication with a suspect and your chance of of a successful and peaceful outcome is is raised dramatically when you can establish that two-way communication and so what i've seen is um, medical health drones where if you've got as you know in the time of covid you can't have somebody come into the office or or just because they're uh, unable to we have seen that application tested where they've put communication devices onto a drone flown that drone into somebody's house and been able to establish a video communication with a healthcare provider yeah it's yeah i mean there's so many uses it's i mean how far away are we from the iv from that (laughs) oh it's a good question i mean obviously in japan they're not far away from being able to deliver my yerba mate teas which are necessary for my morning kick and uh, a good segue into our (laughs) next story it looks like japan has superseded the united states once again in technological aspects as 7-Eleven in Japan is already doing drone delivery. What do you have here, Miriam? So first of all, you have to understand that I have a weird adoration for Asian 7-Elevens. Okay. It's just bizarre, but the width and breadth of snack foods available in Asian 7-Elevens is unbelievable. 
YouTube it. You've got to. It's incredible. So 7-Elevens in Japan, no doubt. I'm not surprised that they're so far advanced. Okay, so on a group, which is the group that runs All Nippon Airways, Japan Airways, uh, I believe it is, worked with 7-Eleven in Japan to do drone delivery from 7-Eleven in an area of Tokyo. Now, what they did was they went from a delivery site to um, a distribution site, to one of four distribution sites, okay? So they did limited routes, right, from one um, delivery site to four distribution sites. However, what they were trying to do was go right for level four certification, which is uh, beyond visual line of sight operations over people. So I got to write this article in collaboration with Juita, which is um, Japan's uh, drone industry network. And so they're able to translate some of the stuff for me and kind of explain how it works. And in Japan, they are trying to um, work on risk-based kind of certification. Level four certification would allow for drone delivery in a retail setting. What they're planning on doing is taking those um, – drone delivery points to the parking lots of existing 7-Elevens and delivering right to retail, uh, right to, sorry, residences. And they can do that delivery in about 20 minutes. Wow. That's, uh, that's unbelievable. Convenience stores just got more convenient. I don't know if they're going to be able to actually like make the ramen there, you know, in Asian 7-Elevens, sometimes they even have like little cafes with microwaves where you can heat up all the great stuff that they have there. Telling you, <laughs> gotcha. The sticky rice and spam awaits. So absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Miriam, for uh, for joining me today this week. And uh, I know I can hear a little sniffle, so I hope you get better, uh, whatever it is. And thank you very much for keeping us all informed. I know I appreciate it, and everyone who watches appreciates it as well. Always happy to be here, Paul. Good to see you, and I'll see you next week. Sounds good, Miriam. That's going to do it for us today, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for another edition of Drone Life News. If you have anything you want us to cover, let us know. You can leave a comment on one of the videos or send in a question to askdroneu.com. But that's going to do it for us today. Thanks again for joining us, as always. <laughs>